And today is a culmination of an enormous amount of work uh, that the city has uh, undertaken and uh, it's, uh, as I said at, uh, at, at the start this morning, certainly a, a credit to, to the city and the councillors, uh, both in terms of their initiative but also their courage, obviously, uh, given uh, the history recent, uh, of, in recent times uh, in, in the city. This morning uh, is, is about presenting to you uh, all about uh, the details of that, of that change, but more importantly, to give you a feel for the, uh, for the thinking at the Council, uh, the aspirations of the Council in regards to development, the opportunities available, and to give, uh, to give us the confidence uh, in Perth uh, about uh, the direction that Fremantle is taking. To start that off, I'd like to introduce uh, the Mayor of Fremantle, uh, Dr Brad Pettit. Do uh, Dr Pettit has served on the Council since 2005 and uh, since 2009 as the, uh, as the elected Mayor of the city. Uh, prior to taking up the role of Mayor, Brad was the Dean of the School of Sustainability at Murdoch University. He continues uh, to be involved in the, at the University on a part-time basis. Uh, Brad informs me that when he's not working, uh, and uh, there isn't much time for this, but when he's not working he likes to ride his bike, surf, drink coffee in Fremantle of course, and, uh, and catch up with the newspapers. So, please uh, welcome Dr Brad Pettit. Thanks, Lena, and great to see so many of you out here today. This is an um, exciting time for you, actually, in terms of reaching out to a broader audience outside of our, our boundaries, and we really appreciate you taking the time to hear about the plans we have for, for Fremantle. I, I think it's a really exciting time. I want to start by just really giving you some background, and um, you, you've got some excellent speakers who will fill you in on some of the detail. But certainly, when I, since I've been on council, and certainly when I was elected mayor, almost two years ago to the day, um, there was a, a clear sense that Fremantle economically um, was in decline, and uneven in decline, I don't want to overstate that, but it was certainly you can see from, 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 the, from the, the, the tables before you that from an economic perspective things were changing. Retail was, was declining, office, um, certainly storage distribution and those kinds of things, manufacturing, all those things within Fremantle that had been the basis of a strong Fremantle economy were declining and there were other things that were improving, the tourism aspects, those kinds of things were certainly improving but we certainly had an uneven economy and there was a real sense that Fremantle as a strong economic centre, as, as, as Perth's second city, as we were talking about in the video, was, was under threat. And um, when, when I was elected um, mayor, that was certainly one of the clear platforms that I ran on and many of the people who ran on at the same time. In fact, today I should also say we've just had another election since then, two years ago, and I'd like to welcome our three new councillors who are here down, 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 down the front, Rachel, Dave and Ingrid. Um, really great to have you on board and I think we've actually got an even stronger council now going forward but I'm going to give you a little bit of background about what we've done over the last couple of years. Um, we really, as, as the video said, one of the first things we did uh, with, with the new council was to focus on a new strategic plan that had a really clear, a clear way forward. There, we actually made a really thin strategic plan that just simply said we, we want to be a city of, that's a unique city of cultural and economic significance. And, and, that, and that's what we've done. And it was, and it was, it was really clear, clearly focused and, and a clear part of that was about strengthening Fremantle's economic capacity. Um, and it, it's, it's a clear plan with a, with a really clear way forward and I think we've got that focus actually means that we can actually start to drive that forward really strongly, which we've been doing over the last couple of years. A key part of that is linking in with the broader planning frameworks of the state government, including Directions 2031. Um, and one of the things that, that that document talks about is there's some clear uh, th things you have to meet in terms of becoming a, 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 pr a primary centre. And Fremantle, I think, wasn't going to be meeting those. In fact, we're likely to be downgraded um, for, for, from that status. So now it's about clearly working towards um, attaining that primary centre status as per second city. Now that includes 1,500 additional dwellings in the CBD. Population is absolutely key. I mean, it's very hard to sustain a city unless you've actually got people living within your, within your centre. It's, you be, might be surprised to know only about 850 people 
currently live in the CBD of Fremantle. It's very, very low numbers. In fact, so, and there's a real opportunity for growing that within Fremantle. It's a great place to live, um, it's, just, it's just not the choice of accommodation. So that's one of, one of the key priorities. Adding an extra 70,000 square metres of A-grade commercial office space. There is office space in Fremantle, but for those of you who, and we know, I've spoken to many of you who have actually been looking for quality office space in Fremantle, not much of it's of high quality, and that's the real problem. So we've, um, so you end up with lots of poor quality office space, um, and and not that diversity. And then the problem is attracting quality businesses in because of that. So we need to be adding to that. And about and 70,000 square metres is a lot, but I think it's an achievable target that we're looking at doing. And as well, 20,000 square metres of extra retail floor space. That actually just takes us back to where we were about 20 years ago. We've actually had a decline in retail floor space over the last couple of decades, and we think that with those extra people living and working in Fremantle, we can certainly sustain that and actually add to that real retail mix, where people can actually live and work and shop in Fremantle all in one place, which is one of the key things that makes Fremantle so significant. What I want to talk to you a bit now about now some of the things we've done, and then I'm going to talk about some of the things that are underway, um, and um, hopefully that'll give you a sense of where we are as, as a city. One of the things that's now bedded away, is being gazetted, is law, is the East End. Um, for those of you who go to Frio um, to, to visit, coming from, from Perth or the northern suburbs, you go over the bridge and you enter into the, the land of car yards and, and pretty, pretty, pretty well dreary um, it's a pretty dreary entry statement. And uh, as I said in the, um, in the video, that was zoned three storeys. We've now zoned that up to actually it's eight, eight or nine um, in, in, in some areas. And you can, and we, we're looking forward to seeing some major redevelopment in that area. That's a primarily residential. It'd be ground floor, non-residential, residential above. We can get a couple of thousand people li li living in that part of town, um, fe fe feeding, in, feeding into Fremantle. Another key way we want more people living in Fremantle is through the small, the small dwelling scheme amendment. I think this is, this is a fantastic innovative idea where we often live on blocks, especially in Fremantle, some bigger blocks. If you have a block that, that, that's more, more than 400 square metres, you can actually put a small dwelling on the back of that and it won't require planning approval as of right. So this is, um, and um, that's currently um, been through the advertising stage and we're, we're waiting for a sign off from the state government for that, but that's looking likely to happen in the next few weeks. Um, and that's up to 5,000 properties throughout Fremantle could have someone living within their backyard. Again, adding to that, that mix around residential, adding to affordability, I think it's a really great way of, of um, get, get, get getting people living with, within Fremantle again. The other one that's really exciting is the Maya development application. You, you'll be aware of is, is that um, for the Maya building, now owned by Serona Capital, and Matthew's here. Um, good, really, really good to have you here. It's um, a very exciting proposal, um, and we look forward to seeing one of the least loved buildings in Western Australia have a facelift. So that's, and that's, um, that, that DA has also now been passed by council. Now, in addition to those things that we've done, is a couple of other initiatives underway that are, that are currently in progress. And I'll, I won't speak about this in detail, but one of the most exciting ones, which was also mentioned in the video, is the Fremantle Union. Fremantle, I think, we've never done this really well, actually, about linking in and actually done proper coordinated planning across agencies, working really cooperatively with, with the state on a number of levels. Many of the projects we're going to do are going to require that coordination and that cooperation. And it's really exciting to have the West Australian Planning Commission, the PTA, Fremantle Ports, um, Department of Planning and Department of Transport all working with us on, on this. And I think we're going to see um, some really innovative and um, great opportunities coming out of, the, out of this union. And Stuart Hicks will talk a bit, of, a bit more about that later today. The main big project that's underway at the moment from a planning perspective is the city centre site. So what we've done in this area is really take, as I said in the video, all the ugly buildings, all the ugly parts of Frio, away from the heritage areas, from Maya to Target to the, to the Woolstore Shopping Centre, Westgate Mall, Point Street, and where the, those areas have been, been pretty well left, not, not a lot's happened there, partly because of the very restrictive heights that are allowed and other, and other planning constraints in that area. And what we're doing is um, it's currently out for advertising, is um, looking at scheme amendments to raise the heights in, in those areas. Um, primarily f around the four to seven storey mark, but there will be a couple of sites, again, if it's exceptional development quality, can go up to nine storeys, um, which I think is a really exciting 
Um, and as you can see, we've been quite careful to do this. So you've got the west end in the foreground there, and then up, up, up towards the back here is all these sites. So this is currently the Woolstore Shopping Centre. And you, you, you get a real sense of where we're, doing, where, where we're targeting this quite carefully. Have a, an, another distinct precinct that will have its own flavour, but will be, um, have much more density than we've previously had in Fremantle. Because we want to encourage high quality, good development in, in, in Fremantle in that regard. So um, there's also a possibility, as I was saying, around the exceptional quality, where we, if you can have a discretionary extra two storeys, if you build buildings that are both environmentally um, innovative in terms of sustainability, but also actually are, are very high design quality. Now that's ultimately, we've actually set up an independent design advisory committee um, that's chaired by Geoffrey London, who many of you will know, who's currently the state um, architect for Victoria. And, um, and what one of the key factors there is that that group will independently advise council on, on design quality. The last thing you want is us councillors who you know, trying to second guess what quality is, and I think we, this is a real key thing where, where the experts should be doing that and giving us that, 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 that advice. With the height limits, um, this is what it currently is. Um, basically, you've got 14 metres, um, 17 metres set back. Uh, and what we're looking at is some extra height limits that, that push it up uh, to 24 metres in, in many cases, and then further beyond that, the discretionary heights um, beyond that. Now, I think it's quite an exciting shift, and I think you get a real sense of the, of the changes in scale in that, in, in that part of town, and the extraordinary opportunities that offers, both in terms of residential development, in terms of quality office space, and in, in terms of revitalised retail. Now these are just some of the sites for those of you who aren't familiar with Fremantle. These are, these are the sites that this scheme amendment will apply to. The Woolstore Shopping Centre site is the biggest one of those um, and um, has a real, real potential for, for offering that. The, across the road from that you've got the, the, the old Gas and Coke uh, car park site, the Westgate Mall. I think you'll all agree that none of these are particularly attractive and we're not going to get much resistance to seeing, to seeing some pretty radical changes in those areas and of course the Meyer and Queensgate buildings. And our, of course our Town Hall Centre where you actually have um, again um, a real potential for revitalising that area. And we also own the Spicer site which is on the corner of near, near the Fremantle Markets. And um, so there's, there's a whole array of those sites, that's not all of them, there's actually more but that gives you a bit of a snapshot at some of them that we're looking at. Now, there's a lot more to do, and I'll, I'll, some of our other speakers will be speaking about this in more detail, but the King Square development is going to be one key part of that. Um, with the Meyer redevelopment now clearly on the, on the cards, um, we've got the city owns a number of other properties surrounding that, um, where we can actually see that part of a really integrated new development that will revitalise that whole part of Fremantle, which is really exciting. And as Stuart Hicks say, says in his video, actually start to really strengthen that central ring, that one that binds us all. So the King Square to redevelopment, we just signed, the council signed off on the MOU on that last week. Um, and we look forward to now to some really robust negotiations around how we must actually, we can actually work with Serona Capital, who are the, who's, who's the owner of the Maya building, to redevelop that whole precinct, which I'm very excited about. I don't think it's overstating it to say that what we're looking at here is the most comprehensive redevelopment and revitalisation of Fremantle since the America's Cup. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's time has come. And I think we've got a great new council who's, who's able to do that. We've got, a very, we've got a lot of support in the community for this. And there's a real sense that it's an exciting time. And I, I'm really pleased to have you all here to hear about it today. And I look forward to taking your questions later on. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. That was terrific. Um, our next speaker is Ray Hareen, Director of Planning and Urban Design at Urbis. Um, you would have uh, re remember from the, the short film at the start that Ray was the author of the Drivers of Activity Centre Development in the Fremantle CBD, a pivotal report that really set up uh, the scene and the context for all of the work that flowed uh, from that and you saw in that, in that video. Um, 
Ray has a strong interest in the development and implementation of activity centres policy and has been one of the forerunners uh, in terms of doing that in Perth since the policy was uh, released some 12 months ago. Um, Ray has worked very closely with uh, industry, particularly in uh, the Shopping Centre Council of Australia, in developing a lot of the uh, direction, new directions for centre expansions, of course, in the metropolitan area. Uh, Fremantle is, uh, is a key part of that. So please make welcome Ray Harim. Thanks, Lino, and uh, thanks very much for you know, indulging me this morning. Um, I, what uh, essentially I'll be doing today is just giving a quick snapshot uh, of the study that was undertaken, and uh, bearing in mind that uh, the, the, I suppose, providing also some commentary about the changes that have been occurring uh, since the report was commissioned. I need to start off by sort of saying that uh, it was an incredibly a uh, brave decision by the Council to actually initiate the study because uh, so often uh, we can acknowledge that there are problems but don't, don't necessarily want to know exactly what's causing them. There was a couple of parts to the study. Uh, in particular, there was the, the assessment of Fremantle's position in the hierarchy, so we were asked to sort of look in, uh, in terms of where Fremantle sat. Uh, the other part was the survey of the developers and investors in relation to, uh, I suppose, their attitudes towards Fremantle and what was basically preventing uh, the desired outcome from happening. With the development survey, uh, there was some clear messages that were coming through. The, and uh, we were, in fact, given a very clear mandate to provide the good, the bad and the ugly. So the, the things that, uh, that the development industry was saying was that Fremantle had a great deal of appeal in terms of the public transport infrastructure, uh, in terms of the street life and public amenity, uh, and the centre's maturity. However, the things that were seen as being the inhibitors were the community ad attitudes towards development, you know, perceived or real, that was what was seen, the flexibility of the planning framework and council's attitudes to development. So therefore, the great challenge was, you know, essentially how was uh, the Fremantle city going to embrace the opportunity and uh, what was it that was going to need to change to uh, modify the perception of the development industry. A significant part of it was that, uh, I mean, Fremantle, as Brad has already highlighted, was traditionally the unrivaled second CBD in the Perth metropolitan area. Uh, however, it's, it was relying, I suppose, on its history and those traditional foundations. The maritime and fishing industry were obviously key, those have changed substantially. Uh, it was traditionally the second largest employment centre that was shifting. And the primary, uh, if you like, cultural and recreational hub, it had uh, a whole lot of, um, I suppose, uh, amenity that other centres didn't have. And it was renowned for its diversity and difference. However, there was a new landscape. This new landscape was uh, created by a few different things. One was that the metropolitan area was growing and it wasn't necessarily growing in this particular neck of the woods. Let's face it, we were stretching out in other directions. There was a changing policy landscape with Directions 2031, which sort of set up the, uh, uh, I suppose, the hierarchy. And I suppose one of the, the, the great uh, um, wake-up calls may have in fact been the fact that uh, in the initial draft that was released, uh, Joondalup and Rockingham were identified as primary centres, with Fremantle being uh, somewhat down there with uh, a bunch of suburban centres. There was uh, other centres positioning and revitalising. Uh, I think per CBD in relation to the cultural and lifestyle components was making significant changes. Uh, Coburn was obviously investing significantly with changes also happening in uh, Stirling and Claremont. All of these things were just modifying Fremantle's position. The retail caps were being lifted, which was res is, is resulting in significant expansion of centres. The emphasis of mixed use, so some of those areas that Fremantle had as unique were no longer going to be particularly unique. And ultimately the government's decision to then leave the primary centre category as vacant, which meant that there was an opportunity for Fremantle to position itself. What is a primary centre? Uh, it's a, a great question and in fact uh, um, spent a significant amount of time talking with uh, people 
uh, in the department who can't necessarily pin it down. Um, but uh, what we can say is that uh, it is not intended to be just a large shopping centre. Uh, a primary centre is supposed to be a secondary CBD, so think Parramatta. So therefore, um, there need to be a dominant employment area, an area for strategic investment. So it needed to be where the government, Commonwealth offices, etc., would locate, where it would be identified as being an alternative location for the CBD. And really, when you look at it, when you look at Fremantle, it had many of the core components that you would expect. However, the planning system, and in fact, it's probably, well, it still is the current planning system, but it's a planning system in modification. The core CBD being limited to three to four storeys was a significant constraint to seeing any significant redevelopment. Um, there were some changes obviously occurring in the East End, um, and I suppose uh, uh, since this study was commissioned and since those changes uh, occurred in the East End, I'm pleased to sort of say we're even having you know, clients uh, come to us uh, and you know, will in fact be lodging an, uh, an application in the East End shortly. So there is some linkage to the changes that are happening and actually seeing some results on the ground. There's been uh, obviously the proactive approach in relation to the Maya site. Uh, and although I you know, believe that there are probably uh, those critics uh, out there, it's always easier to knock than it is to actually do something. Um, but overall, there was a need for focus and clarity of vision. And I think that this is really what not only this study, but the general shifts by the city is now providing. But in terms of the primary centre status, uh, ultimately, it's not going to be a given. And you need to compare yourself to your competition, sizing it up, so to speak. Now, uh, Fremantle is still marginally the largest when you look at pure uh, size and square metres. Uh, however, um, it, the analysis that we undertook is that if you take out the vacant floor space, it somewhat changes. It also relates to the type of spaces that are in fact created within those square metres. And that's where, as uh, uh, Brad mentioned earlier, some of those initiatives about trying to get additional retail floor space and getting the quality office floor space. Uh, there are a number of, uh, um, uh, I suppose, vacant um, office uh, buildings within the Fremantle CBD, but that is because the uh, environment, whether it be government offices, but also contemporary businesses, there are base requirements that you now need to have. And so you need to have that contemporary space available. Um, ultimately, uh, also looking at the, uh, the access, I mean, at the moment there is some great uh, infrastructure in place, but uh, access needs to be key uh, in, in terms of being able to get to the centre. The catchment, Fremantle has the significant disadvantage of um, uh, having the ocean and apparently the occasional shark uh, in its uh, significant catchment area, but it needs to therefore be looking at the, the density uh, um, in terms of trying to sort of deal with that and those characteristics in maintaining its unique position. Size is not everything, uh, as they say. So, but having the, uh, the mixture of uses is uh, also very important. Uh, shopping, this is where probably the uh, Fremantle is um, in the, uh, I suppose, its most disadvantaged uh, position. Uh, obviously now the department store question has been answered and I think that that's an important one because there was talk obviously of that being lost. But if you look at the overall offer within Fremantle, um, it, it's, its desirability as a destination to shop uh, is somewhat secondary and it will need to reposition itself. Obviously the markets and tourist trade has been a strong point, but uh, that in itself is not going to be, uh, be the driver in terms of people making the, the decision as to where they spend their money. Uh, office, uh, as sort of said, uh, it's higher, but generally the, s the small floor plate component and the high vacancy rate. <laughs> Uh, entertainment and culture. Again, this is it, probably it's been its strongest point of difference. But of course, with the Perth CBD fighting back with uh, with investment down that end, there needs to be a renewed focus in terms of retaining that point of difference. So ultimately, its strengths were its history and affiliation, uh, its identity and character, amenity, trading hours. But of course, that's now being expanded to other centres. Stable, however, stagnant catchment and land use diversity. But addressing the weaknesses, and this is really where the action is now taking place, the restrictive planning framework, 
low private investment activity, lack of government investment and commitment, strong competition from other strategic metropolitan centres, restricted catchment growth and clarity of vision. And I think as we're going through today, we're sort of seeing that a number of these things are being ticked off in terms of addressing those points of weakness. So ultimately, the, the conclusions that were drawn from the study were that there are no presumptive primary centres, uh, so with any insurmountable uh, uh, advantages. So Fremantle is in a, uh, I suppose I would consider, a plum position to, uh, to take that. However, there's no room for complacency as the other centres are continuing to grow and evolve. Places like Joondalup with significant institutions and investment going on are obviously going to be a, a significant competitor. Um, but, you know, being a Dockers fan, I'm quite sure that uh, Fremantle, like the Dockers, will come through with the goods. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. Um, the real trick uh, that Fremantle performed here and, uh, and, and, and what's made the, the magic happen, of course, is identifying individuals, individuals with unique skills and a passion for what they're doing. And that's been uh, a thread right through the last 12 months with the advances made in the city. Uh, a good example of that is David Chetliff, our next speaker. David has a, a long list of achievements, heading up the Retail Traders Association, uh, the Committee for Economic Development of Australia, and a, and a private economic consultant in his own right. But I'd rather describe David as the fixer here. Uh, he has, has that ability to bring people together and to deal with those commercial realities. Uh, principally, though, David uh, authored the uh, retail uh, development plan for the city, and that's what David's here to talk about today, that retail model plan that uh, will, is, uh, is, of course, at the core of the developments proposed. Please uh, welcome David. Uh, thank you very much, Lino. Um, it's a delight to, to be here. Uh, the first two speakers have stolen half my thunder, so we'll be able to move very quickly through what I want to talk about, uh, which was the retail model plan that, that was tabled to the city um, just 12 months ago. Um, I was one of the authors. The other author, David West, has been spending the last 12 months in London, um, um, and he'll be back, I think, working with the city a bit um, next year as well. But the key findings of the Retail Model Plan, and that report's on the website and has been on the website, and I'm not going to spend actually a lot of time talking about it today because I want to talk about something else. But the key findings would not surprise anybody in terms of the uniqueness of Fremantle, the geographic and other challenges that Ray was just, just mentioning, the fact that at the time we did the study, retail was at risk, um, that it needs more people, um, substantial competition coming from major um, purpose-built regional centres uh, within the broad area um, and some areas are, are difficult to, to redevelop but others are screaming out for, for redevelopment um, at the moment. Um, there were really two thrusts to the recommendations of the report very quickly and one of the biggest differences you find between typical Main Street uh, retail precincts and purpose-built centres is the way they're managed. You know, people have tended to focus on urban design and malls and all those kinds of things as ways of, of trying to fix those problems. But in fact, it's the management, tenancy mix and marketing and all those kinds of issues that really are at the heart of the difference. So one of the recommendations was to establish a business improvement district within Fremantle. The second was to look at where should additional space be within Fremantle if it was to be developed. And essentially, you know, our brief wasn't to determine the economic viability of that, but to advise the city of where that could be uh, if, there was, if the economics were right and developers wanted to pursue it. And one of the very key recommendations was that King Square, the heart of city, should be the, the centre, not only in terms of civic activity, but also in terms of retail activity, with strong linkages along Queen Street and, and Adelaide Street, if you're familiar with the geography of Fremantle. And so at the end of the day, this little diagram that's become fairly um, well known, and Brad used it in his uh, talk a few minutes ago. Must be a button to work the lights here somewhere. There it is. Um, that's King Square there. This is the railway station precinct down there. This is where Woolworths department store is and Point Street development that Brad referred to. 
Um, along here you've got the, the, the South Terrace uh, Cappuccino area and the Fremantle Markets. And you can see that there are quite long linkages between them. Um, these days I think we would be thinking more of strong linkages through here as well. Um, but that's the sort of model, if you like, that uh, the retail model plan talked about in terms of how, how Fremantle should, should develop its, its area. This West End is really, in terms of major redevelopment terms, is, is really um, you know, off limits. There's, there's minor development can take place there, but the real opportunity that Brad was talking about is, is out in this area here. Brad talked about the two planning schemes, and you can see the one that's already been approved, whoops, is um, is at the um, the east end here, and the new one that Brad was talking about is down in this precinct. So this is the precinct where we're really trying to get some action. And I guess one of the things that we also said in that report that I haven't got a slide for is that the city really needed to give some thought as to how it was going to implement some of these recommendations. Just writing a report doesn't in itself achieve very much at all. And what we said was, look, you could set up a redevelopment authority of some sort, um, but we reckon that was probably a steamroller to crack a walnut and probably not appropriate for the size of the, of the task in Fremantle. Or you could designate a particular officer within the city to, to drive all of this. Our experience has been in other work we've done that uh, officers of the city get, get very busy doing other things and also the credibility in dealing with developers sometimes is, um, is not as good as it could be um, in terms of background and experience and skill sets and those sorts of things. But what you could consider was some kind of intermediary, if you like, um, between the city and the development industry and landowners and the retail industry and all the rest of it that uh, could, could try and encourage the sorts of development that we're envisaging in these reports. And lo and behold, the city turned around and said, well, Shetliff, you're it. And uh, so for the last five months, I've been working not only on the project I'm about to talk about, but also a whole lot of other projects. And my invitation to people today is that if you, if you are interested in following up on development opportunities in Fremantle, um, then I guess I'm the person that's been designated with the task of trying to help you liaise with the city and try and make things happen and share the vision of the city with you and, and try and achieve some, some outcomes uh, beyond the reports that we've been talking about this morning. Going back to the implementation then, the bid is underway. There is a steering committee in place. There's a target to get that up by the middle of next year. And whilst there's been some interesting politics around that over the, in, in the early stages, that's now well on track and, and, and moving forward, which is really about how to make the existing retail offer perform better. Um, the second part of the report is, is really around the development. And the number one project is King Square, as the mayor indicated. And what you can see on this diagram is the Meyer building here and the city's assets all the way around it. And bear in mind this includes a public road through here, Newman Court, uh, which may or may not be, um, be part of any development that takes place. But it's a fairly obvious conclusion to draw that if you, when you look at that kind of, uh, of, of plan, that the owners of those of, of those properties around each other ought to sit down and have a conversation about whether there is an opportunity for some kind of coordinated, integrated development, whatever you want to call it. And, and that's the process that we're underway, that is underway right now with the owner of the Maya building and, and, and the city. And the sorts of the benefits are obvious, you know, consistency of design, shared floor plates, uh, alternative ownership outcomes um, in terms of, you know, the city might own part of the Maya building, Serona might own part of other cities' buildings, all those kinds of things are at least in principle open to us. Um, um, integrated retail tenancy plan uh, and a common engagement with Maya. And whilst Ray in, in, in inferred that, uh, that, that Maya is definitely staying in Fremantle, that's not the case. Um, in the sense that it's not confirmed. Um, negotiations are still proceeding between uh, Serona and Maya and, and, and the city, and, uh, but they've got a very short time frame now in terms of when we need to get it. But Maya have made some encouraging statements, which is not where they were uh, four or five months ago. 
Uh, so we've been exploring options and the Memorandum of Understanding was signed off by, by the City last week um, and uh, all of that is, is an agreement that we will enter into serious discussion and dialogue and due diligence processes between Serena and the City to explore whether we can produce an outcome that is in the interests of the City as well as in the interests of, of Serena. Um, and at the end of that stage, and it's got a deadline of June next year, at the end of that stage we can you know, the, we will either do a deal or, or we won't do a deal and if we can't do a deal then obviously the city will explore other options for its, uh, for its building assets. But the sort of things that are envisaged in that are, are, are listed there, I don't need to, to go through them in the interest of time, you can all read, but uh, there may be others. The, the whole mix is open for consideration at the moment and a lot of discussion is going on around all of that and now that the MOU has been has been agreed to, uh, they can take place in a much more serious and focused way and just as importantly out in the open. Well, one of the things the, the signing of the MOU has done and the passing of that by council has made it all very public to the community, to stakeholders, um, to all sorts of people that may be interested that that, that dialogue is now going on and it will continue to go on until such time as we either reach a deal or we don't reach a deal. The City has all sorts of obligations under the Local Government Act in terms of business plans and transparency that obviously it has to, it has to follow and, and so people will be very well aware of what, uh, of what is proposed um, when, when and if we can reach uh, agreements with, with our partner. Um, at the end of the day, if we get that one right, it will be transformational for Fremantle. It's a symbol that things are changing. The city is being prepared to say, we want developers to come to, the, to Fremantle. We're prepared to put our assets into the mix to try and stimulate that kind of, uh, some initial investment to send signals to the property industry that, that we really are serious about seeing development occur in Fremantle. Uh, for those of you that are interested in investing in Fremantle, please come and see me afterwards and we can do a deal for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
we're a port city, we're an industrial city. Uh, we were at the start of this state when settlers and their meagre possessions were heaped up uh, on the sand uh, outside uh, uh, the mouth of the, uh, uh, of the Swan River. A community which is passionate, engaged, uh, energetic, uh, and a wonderful place to be part of. And what collectively has happened through the years is uh, a city has developed at the mouth of the Swan River that virtually everybody I speak to has a soft spot for. And I'm confident that most, if not every one of us in this room feel positively towards uh, the city uh, and what it has and what it offers. What it has amongst uh, a ra large range of benefits is a set of activity centres which are the envy of every city uh, on this uh, uh, planet. Uh, a set of not Disney-esque sorts of created things, not the sorts of things where developers or local governments sit around and say, what can we do to our city to make it attractive, but rather uh, one that because of its location, uh, its, uh, its sociology, its history, its heritage, the sorts of people that are there, uh, it is an extremely attractive city to be part of. What um, I think we've done generally is manage to mix the heritage issues and the sense of history uh, with the challenges of the 20th century, but now standing ankle deep in the 21st century, the great challenge for the city of Fremantle is how it continues to develop, how it builds on uh, the sorts of activity centres and the sort of attractions that are there, and that in 50 years' time, the Fremantle uh, city of the uh, later uh, uh, 21st century has built on the attractions that are there but done it in such a way that it continues to develop uh, new attractions. Have we always done it right? No, we haven't. I have to say, it took me a long time to wait for a car of that colour <laughs> <laughs> to drive past for my photograph, but I'm not sure that uh, our own city's car park and one which sits within those, uh, that, those yellow rectangles that David just showed us uh, necessarily has a major part to play uh, in the uh, in the free mantle of the uh, of the future, um, but these are important changing times. A take-home message, please, is that we have in place a city united in pursuing the opportunities that are available to it. Uh, for you, please, to see uh, the integrity uh, and capability of our mayor Brad Pettit and his council and his officers, uh, and a commitment uh, to uh, advice uh, and support, and consultation, not to do reports, but to make things happen. And what I see is an important part in what is uh, being pursued in this endeavour is a recognition that the city will not do it of itself. It will be at centre of a relationship which will be a pretty historical change for the way the city has traditionally been seen in the past. Um, certainly myself, uh, I know uh, a lot of senior people in government and in the property council who have been inclined to say, great place Fremantle but God is damned hard to do business with. Uh, the message is that things are changing dramatically in that regard, and that message has indeed been put, picked up uh, on the invitation of uh, Brad Pettit to work together to make those changes. Uh, the creation of something called the Fremantle Union, I must say is a tongue-in-cheek reference, the Fremantle Union, to our industrial past uh, in Fremantle, but something that brings together all the agencies at local and state government level that have their fingers over the knobs and buttons of planning and for them to work as one in pursuing this particular objective rather than for them each to play their own particular part in the, in the process. The Fremantle Union has four main priorities. It has been 
uh, forged out of an agreement uh, between all those agencies to work together to pursue those uh, uh, particular four uh, priorities. Um, that the membership of the Fremantle Union, in addition to me as its chair, comprises uh, the Mayor, uh, Graham McKenzie, uh, the CEO, uh, Josh Wilson and Andrew Sullivan, two of the key councillors of the Fremantle, Eric Lumsden, uh, the Director General of Planning, Rhys Waldock, the Director General of Transport, Gary Prattley, the Chairman of uh, WA Planning Commission, and Chris Lee Hater, who's here today, the CEO of Fremantle Port. At the most senior level, working to ensure that these priorities are pursued in a way that makes sense from all the respective planning uh, agencies' points of, points of view. One is King Square uh, and its vicinity, uh, and the one that uh, uh, David uh, referred to a moment ago. Um, a second uh, key one, uh, it has been agreed, will be the area uh, around the uh, uh, commercial precinct of Victoria Quay. The path is not used for port operations uh, right through to the water itself and the railway station um, uh, in front of it. As I said in the movie that we saw earlier uh, this morning, it is my feeling that our station uh, and the uh, quay offer a fantastic opportunity to join our city uh, back to an activity centre of, 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 of great importance and to do that in a way which is sensitive to uh, the history of the port uh, as well as the ongoing commercial obligations of the, of the port itself. That can be done, that will be done. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Chris Leet Hater and his board uh, will shortly be giving attention uh, uh, to uh, how to pursue that and to do that in a way that takes uh, cognizance of the existence of the railway station uh, right next door, uh, which is uh, underutilised in terms of the access it could and should give to uh, the people and the city itself, and to join the whole thing uh, back um, to the city and its heart uh, itself. Uh, the third priority is to pursue a Fremantle structure plan, to do that as is mandated in uh, uh, directions 2031 and, uh, and beyond, and to ensure that uh, the overall development is, is occurring within that rational structure plan, which will have the support of the membership of the Fremantle Union. And the fourth is to provide support for the city in its important strategic plan and economic development objectives, which have also been outlined to you uh, to today. In terms of the process in doing that, as I say, the union has just been formed. It has been agreed that these will be the priorities. It's certainly important for you, please, to understand the Fremantle Union is not some super council or some new authority. It is a way, simply, of holding together the work and endeavours of a collection of key authorities and agencies, each of which, as I say, have their fingers uh, over the uh, leaves and knobs of, uh, of planning, but it doesn't replace, and nor should it replace, their particular account accountabilities and to set in place the scoping and resourcing of each, each of those uh, priorities. In doing that and with the uh, support uh, of the, uh, uh, the community, uh, the Energetic Council uh, uh, vastly enhancing the way we communicate with uh, uh, state government, uh, with uh, our community, uh, with the uh, uh, development uh, property uh, uh, industries, then Fremantle's future in the 21st century is indeed very bright. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stuart. That's much appreciated. And it should be noted that uh, Stuart walks the talk, of course. He's a long-term resident of Fremantle and, importantly, a ratepayer. So he has an interest, a direct interest there. Um, OK, the floor is now yours uh, for questioning to the panel. Uh, and please, uh, if you raise your, your hand. About all those different zones, can you just let us know, the former I, uh, ING plan on the wall, is that something that is now put aside, or is that something that may come to the floor again? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, the, the ING development is not going to proceed, um, and that formally now has finished that work, and therefore, uh, as I say, uh, Chris Sledhater and his board are now attending to the new opportunities now that the I ING opportunity has uh, passed by. Yes, sir. Uh, look, how much unique asset in the has to be at all? Um, Get rid of the explosions on the simple railway line, which are the two difficult things to do. But vision out 10 years has to be, you could have three or four thousand high-class residential units on that board. COVID is eventually going to happen, and there's going to be a lot of people who will be able to port facilities, containerships go down there, we
Uh, is it chips in Fremantle where they put chips out? Surely that's going to give us such a unique advantage. Any other strategic region of China is in the whole of Australia. Comments, please. You go first, Brett. Okay, I'll, I'll start and then I'll hand over to Stuart. I know who's been doing some work. I mean, I guess the key thing to say is I think, oh, in fact, I know because the surveys have been done, the vast majority of Fremantle people certainly support a working port. I mean, I think the point you're making is that working port needs to be better connected to the city, and I think that's what Stuart's re re really well outlined. And opportunities to actually draw, <coughs> often you, you know, in Fremantle, you don't actually know you're near the water. There's that real sense of you feel separated from the water. And I think if we can start to connect to the port, connect to the water, as you say, make that railway line less of a barrier, I think it's absolutely key. On the residential question, I'm, I'm, I won't be surprising anybody by saying I, I know that's off, certainly off Fremantle Port's agenda. I mean, I think they're really keen to make sure it stays a working port and therefore least long-term residential uses in terms of people living on, 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 on the, within that buffer zone is off the agenda, but, and that's why the commercial precinct will primarily be office. I think you've covered it pretty well, Brad. <coughs> yes, sir, down the back. Can you please uh, stand and maybe identify who you're, sure, you're from? Sure, yeah. um, I'm just uh, I'm interested in the longevity of the this plan. Given that it's kind of politically driven to some extent, and um, that this community, although it's very ambitious to develop in the community WA, so you're not going to put a big project in train if you think the rules won't change. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to the kind of sense of security that you might have in this, this program going towards it. Perhaps I can start and then, I mean, I think one of the great things about doing the scheme amendment process is that once you've amended your scheme, it's locked in. So the East End, for example, is now locked in and um, I can't see a government agreeing to us going back to lowering heights within our, within our city centre. Um, we're currently out for advertising on the city site scheme amendment um, and once again we've gone through that process and it's locked in, it's locked in. And I think that really does offer... That, that sense of security. And I guess I'd also say, to be honest with you, we're now in, in a world of DAPs and in, in, in development assessment panels. Anything worth more than $3 million, you can take it to a DAP. So I think those two things combined, I think, should give people a... F I mean, even if council wants to change, at the moment I think you've got a very progressive council that's would, um, along with its quality, say, say yes to, um, to, to most things within Fremantle. But, um, but I think those two things combined should offer a real sense of security in terms of investment going forward. Another question from the panel. Yes, sir. Uh, Fred, Chaney, Fred, Fred. Is there a strategic willingness and interest from the state to help drive something else? Probably not much of that in detail, but I think it's a different part of the plan. Fred, are you thinking of, of, of money or no, other things? Yes, yes. Um, uh, excellent question because that, that I think is really at the heart of uh, the formation of something called Fremantle Union to bring those key players in so they are sharing with us and we are sharing with them what those particular issues are. There are discussions already going on in terms of those sorts of uh, opportunities as, uh, as well. Having key state government players inside the process rather than outside, as I said before, is, is revolutionary in terms of how these things are often done, which is a city tries to make something happen and then goes and attempts to market what it has to offer to the, to the, to the state government. Sitting around the table on Fremantle Union as these things unfold is the opportunity for those key players and indeed, indeed through them the other connections with state government to, 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 uh, to kick it along. Um, Fremantle Union doesn't, I, I hasten to say, look very much like Stirling Alliance. Um, uh, for lots of reasons, not least of which it, it, it has no bureaucracy, it's not a whole collection of people doing studies behind, it's a way of holding together all key players so that we can actually get the momentum and the understanding that hitherto has not, not been uh, there and I'm pretty optimistic that that's the, the way forward um, and uh, the proof of course will be in the pudding uh, that we'll, we'll see. Whilst it might sound you know, idealistic and naive, I as some of you know, come from South Australia, sort of fly in, fly out, sort of Mr. Fix-It. But um, the, the experience in South Australia recently around developments um, has very much been on the political model of announce and then have to defend. 
I think the, the model that we are trying to embrace in Fremantle through the union and through the work that I'm doing and the work that, that Brad and the council themselves are doing is much more about um, engage and develop together. Uh, and it seems to me that that's a, a, a much more effective model for producing outcomes than the traditional announce and defend strategy that we've seen in governments adopt uh, all over the country in, in, in recent years. If I could uh, also add to that, I mean, one of the things that uh, we have also done with Fremantle is looking at, for instance, government uh, floor space in, for, for office, because the whole thing is, is that, uh, as I sort of mentioned before, there is a limited amount of that sort of space to go around, and it's a competitive environment. And government agencies like the private sector uh, have certain requirements in terms of that contemporary space. So part of this has also been feeding into creating an environment whereby there are those opportunities for that to be developed within Fremantle. Uh, I mean, obviously, Landcor have, have had a stake in Fremantle for re quite some time, but there's been other elements that have needed to sort of come in, and the Commonwealth even needs to be part of that process. But I think government investment uh, and government commitment to a location just becomes far more palatable if they feel like they're going to be in with, a, well, you know, backing a winner as opposed to perhaps coming up to uh, uh, opposition to their own proposals. Is there another question from the panel? Brad, because I have one, and I think it needs to be asked. Um, uh, with, the, uh, with the council elections on Saturday, could you maybe give us a, a bit of uh, a review of how, how that went and how the council now uh, shapes up for the future? But also, importantly, um, the, the realities of Fremantle, that perception we talked about before, and the various groups in Fremantle that are vocal, um, can you just talk to those yes, and, and tell us about the resolving council? Certainly. Um, when I was elected two years ago, I think um, there was a, a really great bunch of new, younger, fair to, fair to say, council um, that, that, that replaced what was broadly known as a pretty conflicted council for the, for the years before that. We've had an election a couple of days ago and it was really great to have our three new, three new councillors here and I, I can honestly say that I think we've actually got even a stronger council now. One that uh, where I think the vision that we're talking about is being broadly accepted across council and you can s show by the fact that all these people were elected is also broadly accepted within the community. In Fremantle there's always going to be a very vocal minority against change against development. That, that, that's the nature of Fremantle. And I guess I, I would just add to say, look, that, that's fine, and I, I think it's always important we have a robust debate about Fremantle's future, and I'm happy to do that. But I think what we've seen is a, is a fundamental shift in community attitudes, actually a real recognition that Fremantle was heading in the wrong, in the wrong direction, that we, and we really need to do something proactive and strong about that. And I've got a real sense that isn't it, not only is there strong council support, but there's really strong community support for that as well. Thanks, Brett. We're getting very close to our to nine o'clock, which is when we're scheduled to finish. So I've got time for possibly one last question. No? Okay, look, uh, I'd like to uh, voice our, the appreciation of the, the Property Council uh, to, the, uh, to the City of Fremantle, of course, for choosing to partner with us early on in the process. It's been a very good thing for us, and uh, I, I'm sure that it'll be a good thing for, for the industry generally, and uh, we look forward to, to that future. Please uh, uh, also uh, join me in thanking not only the City of Fremantle and the CEO, Graeme McKenzie, who helped support today, but uh, importantly, our, our four speakers today. Please thank me in, join, in joining me. <laughs> Gentlemen, we do have a small gift for you at the table, which I'll give to you uh, later. But uh, that just draw proceedings to a close. Thank you for, for coming today. It's been a, a wonderful event, certainly a celebration, and we look forward to the, uh, the, the bright future in the city of Fremantle. Good consultant thing. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.